We will have five presenters this morning. We'll try to keep uh, the presentations to 50 minutes, uh, so there'll be time for questions. Uh, we will not be cut off at an hour, but uh, nevertheless, we, we are kind of hopeful we can keep this to an hour. The first presentation will be by myself. I'll be followed by uh, Steve Dvorak, who will talk about the benefits of, of winter wheat. We'll then hear from Blake Vandervorst, who will talk about winter wheat establishment. Uh, John Lukash will talk about nitrogen phosphate phosphate fertility, and finally, Marcia will uh, address the issues of winter wheat disease management. Well, let me dive in then, talking about winter wheat and prevent plant acres. Uh, as you can, as you know, we have a lot of prevent plant acres out there, and there seems to be a great deal of interest in planting winter wheat this fall. Uh, one of the obvious advantages of, of doing so is that you'll have a crop that will be there in the spring, if our spring is going to be wet and difficult to get into the field like it's been the last few years, at least there's a crop there. I've, I've heard a lot of farmers this year say their best crop was winter wheat because of that very issue. So what are some of the issues then we need to be aware of uh, with regard to uh, planting winter wheat on prevent plant acres? Uh, first of all, I'm say that winter wheat does meet the requirements of a cover on a prevent plant acres whether it is planted with or without what we call a residue crop. If it is planted, it cannot be hayed or grazed prior to November 1st. Now, you know, normally we'd think that's not an issue, but, you know, if someone was planting winter wheat now and, and wanted to use it as a, as a, as a fodder uh, to graze it, uh, it would not be um, acceptable until after the 1st of November. Uh, one may be disadvantage of a, of a winter wheat crop as a, as a cover crop is that there will be limited summer water use. Um, I think as we look at the situation at the moment, that may not be much of an issue because it might be difficult to plant any kind of, of uh, cover crop until uh, later in the year anyway. What do we want to consider when we're uh, planting winter wheat on prevent plant acres? I think, first of all, we, we want to use site selection that will favor winter wheat. Um, we want to consider previous residue management, uh, planting date, weed and volunteer control, and management practices that enhance winter wheat survival because in many cases we will be planting into a situation that is probably suboptimal for um, winter survival. Talk about site selection. Uh, number one, if you've got fields that have sanding stubble, I would say that's our number one choice uh, because uh, standing stubble is going to catch snow, insulate winter wheat, and just reduce the risk that we have of winter, winter kill. Um, so select fields that have the most direct previous crop residues, either small grain or canola, and I know there are some no-till sit uh, situations out there where there may be some reasonable standing stubble still after this uh, summer of heavy rains. And you might, as a second option, you might consider fields where volunteer crops uh, such as small grains, canola, or flax are stably, sufficiently dense that if they are terminated that they could catch snow through the winter months. I know there's a lot of volunteer canola fields out there, and, and I'm not exactly sure at what time you need to start the termination process to get ahead of any seed set, but you know that could be a, a, an option uh, for uh, establishing a residue or, or planting into a residue. The next would I would say consider fields with sta without standing residue that have some protection from uh, winter winds, uh, either adjacent to shelter, shelter belts, avoid, avoiding hilltops, and those kinds of things. Well, for those, uh, how do we manage the residue? Uh, I would say we want to minimize uh, wheel tracks. If you are going to plant into an existing residue that's probably beat up a little bit already, uh, trying to do most of your spraying based on, on the same tracks that have already been there. Um, another option is that we consider establishing a residue crop. We've had a lot of discussion about what might be a reasonable residue crop. Uh, small grains seem to be an obvious option because it's relatively cheap seed. Uh, 
And I think if we did plant towards the end of July, uh, the, the period we're entering into, we could probably de develop a reasonable stubble. I think the concerns that I have is that uh, to be in compliance with prevent plant provisions, it cannot be wind road prior to that no November 1st date. And so you are going to be left with a pretty tall, uh, heavy residue to plant into. I think the other issue with a, a small grain crop is that breaking the grain bridge will be problematic. The uh, most commonly recommended re residue crop would be flax strips or flax, solid seeded. Um, and the planting date for those is fast approaching. I would say that we'd want to have that in by the 1st of August in most parts of the state. Uh, you can use a solid seeded three to four foot wide rows or strips that are three to five foot apart that have a spacing of about 15 feet. Uh, you want to keep the seeding rate um, relatively high if you're going into strips, uh, but uh, for the most part, want to be as economical as possible in your seed costs. The next option is planting date. You want to select a date that is, uh, it seems to be critical. There's the, the normal delicate balance of planting either too early and, and uh, having problems or planting too late and not having a sufficiently strong plant to carry you through the winter. In the northern tier, our recommended planting dates is kind of that 1st of November to 15th of September, 1st of September to 15th of September. Um, if you've got a lot of green tissue around, that may you, you may be just kind of in the middle of that would be recommended. Uh, too early will predispose crops to winter injury, and uh, it may also increase the it will definitely increase the risk of, of wheat streak mosaic. Uh, earlier you are, there's just more green tissue around, more opportunity for that mite to fly into the area or be carried into the area. Of course, planting too late, you end up with a small plant that may not develop uh, well. In our, our recent uh, uh, research, we found that planting date, uh, you know, and, and being in that earlier range of a planting date certainly helps provide some winter hardiness. You want to have good weed and volunteer control because you want to break the green bridge. And Marcia will talk a little bit more about the weed streak mosaic, but uh, certainly a two week break is, is minimal, making sure there's no green grasses or volunteer cereal plants. Uh, they will, there's a high risk that they, they will have the weed streak mosaic. And, and if they are green, when the winter wheat comes and emerges, that, that, that means that there's a bridge. That, mites can go directly from one green plant to another, carry the virus with it. So I think in, in the area where we've got lots of volunteers out there and weeds, grassy weeds, want to do a good job of weed control prior, prior to planting. So what are some other options we might have when we're planting into stubble, uh, into a field that is, is not, does not have stubble? We want to certainly manage to increase winter survival. As I mentioned, uh, go on the earlier side of the planting date, choose varieties that are at least as winter hardy as Jerry, and I think in following speakers will talk about some of those options that are available. Applying some phosphorus with the seed can improve survival, not, um, and so that might be another option that you might consider. And so I think with that, I'd just Okay. Uh, again, recommend that I, I, I believe that uh, winter wheat does provide a great option for some of those prevent plant acres. It needs to be managed in a way that we enhance winter survival. And uh, I did in this presentation offer a few suggestions that would help us in that regard. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody is doing well. Uh, Steve Dvorak here with DU. Uh, just wanted to, uh, before I get into uh, answering some of the why questions uh, as to uh, reasons that growers would consider planting winter wheat or incorporating that into your rotation, uh, a couple housekeeping things. 
Uh, I did notice there's not a lot of questions coming in. We are going to save questions to the end, but uh, if you've got questions on your mind and you want to make sure you get addressed, uh, we can start logging those now. So on the lower left, if you want to enter in some questions in the in the, the the box there, I would encourage you to do so, and we'll keep track of those and address those at the end. With that said, I'll move along. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, there's there's multiple reasons to consider winter wheat, and I hopefully we'll touch on some of the highlights. I think I've got five focus reasons, uh, but obviously there are more than, than what we've got here. Uh, the number one reason most growers will tell us that they've included winter wheat in their crop rotation is is the benefits they see in, in spreading the workload. Being able to get a portion of your crop seeded in the fall certainly is attractive and beneficial and brings sanity back to our springs, hopefully, uh, when we're battling uh, uh, the calendar and, and Mother Nature that doesn't always cooperate. Um, not only on your planting operations, but also uh, your your uh, harvest schedule is started earlier in the summer, so we can uh, spread the workload when it comes to harvest time as well. And then lastly, I would, I would point out that um, there is an opportunity, depending on your situation, to improve your capital use efficiency. In theory, you should be able to uh, do more acres with the same equipment or do uh, the same number of acres with smaller or less equipment. Uh, but anyway, spreading the workload is uh, is uh, the most common uh, the most common uh, cited reason that most people will include or like to have winter wheat in their rotation. Um, uh, you will not see crop rotation benefits as one listed here. Uh, I would like to mention that. Uh, one of our key growers says that winter wheat does rotate very well with Arizona in the winter. So uh, maybe that's something else to consider. Um, secondly, not only does it spread your workload, but it reduces your workload. If you look at uh, the estimate, estimations uh, with the North Dakota Farm and Ranch Business Management Program, as far as how much labor is required per acre by crop, uh, winter wheat um, is one of the least requirements for, for labor. According to their estimations, averaged over the last seven years, uh, 1.1 hours of labor per acre uh, for winter wheat versus 1. Point, almost one and a quarter hours for soybeans and 1.6 hours for corn. Uh, if you do the math, a 6,000 acre farm, corn soybean rotation, uh, if you would diversify and go to a third corn, a third soybeans, and a third wheat with half of those wheat acres being winter wheat, uh, the workload actually on an annual basis would have been reduced by about 600 hours. So that's like 10, 10 weeks of vacation for somebody. So it's not just spreading the workload, but it also oftentimes will reduce the workload. Third reason that, uh, and maybe most important, is profitability. And I think that's a question that a lot of people have or, or believe that winter wheat is not profitable or not competitive uh, relative to the other choices you might have. And uh, so what I did, going back to an unbiased uh, uh, source of information with real numbers from real producers, looking at the farm and ranch business management programs from both North and South Dakota, and both of them have shown that winter wheat is very competitive, and I'll show you those numbers in a little bit. Uh, but basically, to summarize it before I show you the numbers and overwhelm you, uh, when compared to the big three corn, soybeans, and spring wheat, winter wheat, um, on average, over the last seven years, has been more profitable than spring wheat in both North Dakota and South Dakota and all three crops in South Dakota. So here are those numbers. Uh, just looking at net return on labor and management um, and having the North Dakota numbers separate out from South Dakota, uh, you'll, you'll see how they compare. Uh, I would note that uh, the North Dakota numbers are only from cash rent acres, um, and in South Dakota they don't make that distinction. But in North Dakota it's, it's the cash rent uh, reported acres in that program uh, trying to make sure we have a representative land charge in the cost. But uh, you look at uh, the variability over years from 2004 to 2010, you see that uh, some years one crop is the most profitable and the next year something else. Um, and, and I think that's part of the message is that uh, in, in the old days when grapple was farming and you didn't have a lot of the, the risk management tools and, and government programs and insurance that we have today, um, he managed his risk by, by diversifying and not putting all of his eggs in one basket. And I think that, that message is still true today, and it's still a, a viable risk management approach. Uh, I will point out, uh, if you look at the, uh, the red circles in the lower right, or the right side of the, the tables, that uh, winter wheat was the most profitable crop, profitable crop of the four in uh, North Dakota, two out of the seven years, and in South Dakota, four out of the seven years. 
Now, now fourth uh, reason to consider winter wheat is risk management. And I'll go through several uh, issues or, or subtopics within risk management. The first one being exposure risk. If you look at the same uh, database from, from uh, the Farm and Ranch Guide or the Farm and Ranch Business Management uh, Programs, uh, when it comes to total input costs, spring wheat, winter wheat, soybeans are all similar from 200 to 250 bucks an acre to put the crop in. Relative to corn, which is 400 bucks an acre now, um, there is much less cash outlay and much less exposure risk uh, with, with winter wheat, especially relative to something like corn. Secondly, environmental risk. Uh, when I talk about environmental risk, I'm, I'm talking mostly about our year-to-year -year climate variability and not being able to forecast with any measure of much confidence what kind of a year we're going to have when it's, when it's uh, crop planting time. Uh, some years, uh, the row, row crops, the, the row crops, the full season corn and soybeans are favored. Some years, the small grains, the cool season crops are favored. Uh, not being able to know what the year is going to bring. Again, not putting all of your eggs in one basket tends to make some, some sense. I will uh, note that when it comes to the wheats, spring wheat versus winter wheat, there are different environmental risks. Um, spring wheat is susceptible to the heat that comes in the summer. If it comes too early, uh, the heat at pollination time will put a lid on the yield potential of that crop, whereas winter wheat has primarily, uh, in large part, uh, already got a lot of yield made. On the converse side, winter wheat is, is prone to winter injury, and I think that's a big concern a lot of people have. And, uh, and I, I think it's a little bit, uh, a little bit over, over, overly feared. Uh, if you look at just the NAS numbers, the National Ag Statistics Service, on their abandonment rates over the last 10 years, uh, the average abandonment rate for winter wheat, and you assume a large part of that is because of winter kill, is about 10%. Uh, but nonetheless, spring wheat still has about a 5% abandonment rate from flooding, from hail, from uh, drought, who knows. Uh, so it really is not as big of a deal as, as most people um, think. And with aggressive management, making sure the residue and the stubble is addressed and a good winter hardy variety is, is chosen, um, the risk of winter kill is much, much lower than most people think. Thirdly, under risk management, uh, uh, need to consider crop insurance benefits, and I, this may be true in North Dakota for certain, uh, but in North Dakota, spring wheat and winter wheat classes are combined when proving your yields. And because of uh, winter wheat's higher yield potential, um, the benefit not only for the winter wheat acres is applied to the spring wheat and proving up your, your wheat yields and increasing your level of coverage and protection for not only your winter wheat acres, but also for your spring wheat acres. And here, here is uh, NAS numbers again as far as yield, spring wheat versus winter wheat over the last 20 years in North Dakota. You can see the trend, uh, both, both yields of both, of both crops are improving, but winter wheat probably at a faster pace and the gap tends to be or trending to widen even as time goes on. And, and again, largely uh, a lot of that uh, yield advantage from the winter wheat is because of it avoids a lot of that early heat that puts a lid on, on the yields of uh, spring wheat. And lastly, under risk management, uh, and the hot topic of this year is all the pre prevent plant frustrations that we're dealing with. And, and again, just better odds of getting the ground that is prone to getting too wet seeded in the fall than in the spring. And the last thing I'd mention would be environmental benefits. Um, reducing soil erosion. Most of our erosion, whether it's wind or water, uh, occurs either late fall and more so early spring when we don't have a lot of actively growing crop or plants out on the landscape. And that's a nice benefit that winter wheat provides is that it does provide that cover, that actively growing crop when others are, are yet to be seeded. And the reduction in, in overland uh, water erosion, uh, reducing sedimentation and nutrient movement uh, over the landscape. Uh, and secondly, improving water quality from that benefit also, uh, since we have an actively growing crop in the fall and early spring, when a lot, of, a lot of water is moving through the profile, we can capture some of that nitrogen and sulfur that is prone to leaching with an actively growing crop like winter wheat. Uh, another thing that I'd, I'd like to mention environmentally that is a, a big benefit and I think a growing issue is the saline affected soils. Um, most winter wheats have some level of salt tolerance, uh, but generally we see that in the fall when we're seeding winter wheat, um, the 
salt accumulation on the surface oftentimes isn't as great as early in the summer or some rainfall events in the late summer can can leach it deeper and uh, we just don't have as much problem getting a crop established. Um, and then lastly, because we have an actively growing crop early in the spring again, when most of our salts are accumulating because the water is just evaporating off the surface, the crop is actually using the water instead of being allowing it to evaporate. And lastly, winter wheat's wildlife friendly, both ducks and pheasants find it very attractive for nesting and uh, nesting success because there's little spring disturbance uh, is greatly improved for both species. So with that, I think I've used more than my share of time. I'll turn it over to Blake Vanderbilt. Uh, thank you, Steve, and, and I'd like to thank uh, NDSU and Dr. Ansem and Dr. McMullen for uh, hosting this webinar and, and utilizing NDSU facilities to do so, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to cover some of the similar things that, that Dr. Ransom covered, uh, but more from a, a continuous cropping perspective of uh, planting winter wheat into uh, canola stubble, flax stubble, uh, uh, pea stubble, uh, uh, spring wheat stubble, and so on. Uh, so the, the angle will be slightly different, but, but very similar, and so I'll probably be able to shave a little time off here. I just want to talk a little bit about, again, that importance of prior crop uh, for and why it is important. Uh, one is, is you want to select a prior crop that hopefully will have early harvest that will allow you to have a seeding date that's compatible with the winter wheat to, to have proper plant development. Uh, and with, also with that prior crop, then you want uh, a crop that has standing residue following harvest, and you want to manage that standing residue so you have the adequate height uh, to assure winter wheat survival with, with adequate snow catch. Uh, take, for example, if you're using a small grain as a prior cover crop, you know, the minimum they say is you need six inches. Uh, my preference would be is that you probably had 10 to, to 14 inches of, of wheat stubble or oat stubble or, or barley stubble if that's the crop you choose to seed into. Um, if you're planting into a, a pea stubble uh, or a lentil stubble or something like that, then you need to take into consideration your variety selection and, and obviously your cold, cold tolerance because you have very little snow catch or, or soybean stubble is another example of that. Um, and then conversely, if you have the less dense residues in terms of stems per square foot, such as canola and flax, uh, there you want taller stubble. Generally, you, you like to see a, a 12 inch or, or greater stubble height on, on those particular crops. But those two crops make, make for good rotation for, for a number of reasons. Uh, also, if you have an early uh, harvested crop prior to the winter wheat, you have an opportunity for soil water recharge and for, for better establishment of the winter wheat crop and that winter wheat seedling for early winter survival. Uh, you've heard a lot about Wheat Street Mosaic, and you'll hear it probably from almost each of the speakers. Uh, it's a really critical issue, uh, but the prior crop can have an impact on that. If you, if you have volunteer grains coming up in your prior crop, uh, small grain stubbles, uh, you enhance your opportunities for uh, uh, contracting the Wheat Street Mosaic virus uh, because of the wheat curl mite. And uh, so, uh, again, the canola flax rotation thing is, is desirable from that standpoint. Also, if you, if you have that break between the prior crop harvest and winter wheat seeding date, it gives you opportunities to, to do some weed control. And those things are all critical components of, of uh, selecting that prior crop. This is some data from, from Dr. Ransom and, and Dr. McMullen's trials at Prosper, North Dakota back in 2003 and 2004 year. And uh, it's the effect of the crop residue and the variety on winter survival. If you look at the top four varieties, the Seward, Elkhorn, Falcon, and Jerry, they're all considered to have good cold tolerance. And then if you look at the Jagaline, Millennium, New Plains, and Harry, they're considered to be, you know, fair to, to poor uh, cold tolerance. And then if you look at the two residue crops that he has, their soybean residue and, and wheat residue, you can see that those four less winter hardy crops uh, were only in that 20 to 30 percent uh, yield level. In a, and you can look at the, the more winter hardy ones that having a 60 to 70 percent survival rate. And so if you look at the yield graph, which I did not uh, bring here today, but uh, the yields are considerably higher, obviously, for those that had good survival. However, if you look at the wheat residue, you can see they were all in that, that 50 to 70 percent range, and you pretty much negated any yield differences when you, you look at the yields in the wheat residue from those varieties. So one of the things that we've kind of noticed over the course of the years is if you can get 45 to 50 percent survival, and generally that negates the, the survival issue differences in terms of yield. The other thing that I just wanted to mention uh, from a survival standpoint is is to try to avoid harrowing fall, uh, following the prior crop harvest. It seems like once you go through those fields with a harrow, uh, it has a tendency to 
lay the stubble down once you go through it with a drill. It has a tendency to weaken the base of that, that prior crop residue. So uh, the, the top two photos are actually from Wells County and, and the road dividing them uh, was right there. So they're right across the road from each other. Both were Jerry variety and, and uh, both had, had the starter treatment. So everything was pretty similar with the exception one at Harold and the other one had not. And the residue was down after seeding on the one field. The other shot is, is close by that same field the same year. It was in a pea field. And you can see the importance not only of standing residue, but of a little bit of surface residue just to simply delay some of that snow melt in the spring of the year and to stop the breaking of the dormancy up too early. Uh, Joel mentioned we, we talked a little bit about varieties. Uh, obviously, the characteristics uh, probably are the primary concern, but there are others as well. Uh, one is the grower, obviously, is yield. Uh, two is, is winter hardiness. And, and when we talk with growers, uh, before we, we even start talking varieties, about the first question we ask is, what are you going to be planting into? If you're planting into pea or soybean stubble versus planting into wheat or canola stubble, uh, it, it opens up a whole different selection of varieties uh, that you can choose from based on winter hardiness. So that's one of the first questions we ask, and then it quickly narrows down the varieties, and, and then you can get into the straw length and strength, which is, is critical, <clears throat> the disease and the quality and the maturity issues. And uh, many of the growers are, if they're looking at managing intensively for high yields, adding additional nitrogen and using fungicide programs, will have a desire to go to the shorter straw and stronger straw varieties. Uh, we look at those varieties, uh, broken it into kind of three groupings by colors. The, uh, the group with the yellow are considered to be our, our good uh, cold tolerances. Uh, you get into the Expedition, Balkan, Harding, Lima Strike, and Yellowstone, they're, they're just a notch below that. And then as you get into the Overland, the Wesleys, Millenniums, Hawkins, Arts, and Jagalines, those are where you, where you probably only have fair uh, cold tolerance to, to minus fair uh, type cold tolerances. So uh, keep those in mind and then please keep in mind what the conditions are uh, that the grower will be seeding into as you select these varieties. Uh, just going to mention two of these, these releases actually that are, are currently, uh, that are current or within the last year. Uh, Cy Wolf is being released this year by AgriPro and will be going only to the or seed associates this fall. And so seed will not be available until a year from now. But it's a short variety similar to Jagalene, if you're familiar, or Hawken. And uh, it has very good straw strength, probably the best straw strength of any of the varieties we're testing in our plots right now. Uh, has high yield potential, a fairly good leaf disease package. Again, most of these varieties are susceptible to scab. And uh, so those will be some of the things you'll need to consider. Uh, Decade is a new release, a joint release from the Montana State Breeding Program that's being jointly released by NDSU. Looks very good. Again, very susceptible to scab. Is also very susceptible to, to the leaf rust and stripe rust complex. Uh, so we will need to manage for those things. Uh, we're a little, uh, have some questions yet as to the cold tolerance of the side wolf. We haven't had a good read on it the last two years. So that'll be another issue we'll have to, to watch out for. Uh, planning day, I'll approach it just from a little different angle than Joel did. I agree with Joel's uh, listing, so uh, something Joel Conversman and, and I have talked about from the University of Minnesota is, is it should be early enough to have a two to three leaf seedling before dormancy, but it should be late enough to allow effective control of winter annual perennial weeds, and it should be late enough to avoid the green bridge and problems with hessian fly and wheat streak mosaic virus and the barley yellow dwarf virus. Uh, the wheat chromite spreads the wheat streak and the aphid spreads of our yellow dwarf. And as you move your seeding date later into September, the activity of both of those insects decreases. And so your risk of infection really decrease, decreases. One thing I just highlighted in white there was do not seed in August. And please communicate that message uh, to yourself as a grower or to you as, a, as an agronomist. And again, that seeding date depends on breaking the green bridge and the geography of which you are in. Uh, seeding depth. One to one and a half inches, that's what I call the zone. And you can see by looking at the chart there, uh, those plants that were seeded at two inches or less have a fairly visible crown, or uh, excuse me, a crown, yes, crown, and uh, with substantial size, and that's your overwintering mechanism for the winter wheat plant. And so you can see those plants that were seeded at four or two and a half inches, uh, and you can barely observe the crown on either of those. And both of those plants have died in this, in this circumstance in the field setting. So you get that seeding depth up there at one to one and a half inches. Is that crown is desires to set up at three quarters of an inch to about an inch in the soil, depending on the seeding depth. And that initial, then as soon as the plant uh, breaks the surface, it will initiate the development of that crown. Uh, the seeding rate, 
And research shows that 900,000 to 1 million pyrolyzed seeds per acre can attain the maximum yield. However, our environment and our seeding conditions aren't always ideal. And we do recommend a 1.2 million pure live seed seeding rate and possibly increasing that as you move into the latter part of September. The reason for that is, is obviously when we can have winter kill, uh, your lading seeding dates will have a less developed plant and a, and a more poorly developed crown. Uh, you can have dry soil conditions at seeding and a number of other issues. And, and so we've uh, slowly uh, increased that, that rate. We recommend seed treatments. You look at some of the vision data over a three year period at five locations and uh, four of those five locations showed a very nice response to seed treatment in winter wheat. Uh, we also heard about phosphorus and we'll hear some more from John about that. Uh, just look at the first three bars, the zero P, the 25 pound P and the 50 pound P from three years, or excuse me, five locations of last year research with ducks unlimited trials. And you can see that where we respond uh, very well. And those sites range from very low to very high tests uh, for the phosphorus. So just in summary, uh, make sure you, you look at your prior crop and you manage that prior crop harvest so you keep adequate standing residue and you spread that residue and chaff uh, with the combine and try to avoid the harrow. Uh, variety selection is critical uh, and it starts with, with standing residue and, and the winter hardiness of the variety. Manage for wheat streak mosaic, break that green bridge. Uh, planting date is is based on uh, the wheat streak mosaic virus and the geography uh, within which you live and the conditions which you have. So the planting rate again, 1.2 million pure life seed, planting depth one to one and a half inches, and we encourage you to use seed treatment and a phosphate starter. And uh, be sure to check out our, our website, www.wintercereals.us. John? Good morning. You might notice from indecision on picking that it's my first time on this type of deal. There. With that, I'm going to give you a little bit on fertility. It needs to be fast and brief, so I've skipped over a couple things there. With that, I'm going to skip the nitrogen-fungicide interaction. I think you know it's a tremendously important part of winter wheat if you want to raise the high yields. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple things that aren't quite as obvious. That's with the starter phosphorus. This is some data from 85, 86 from up in Manitoba. We're working with phosphorus across the bottom scale there with the low to medium soil test, nitrogen on the on bars as you move back. Take a look at that without nitrogen on the, the phosphorus rates in the front here, you see a five bushel yield gain on those low testing soils there from phosphorus without nitrogen. And you get the huge increase in yield from the first increments of nitrogen, but you still see a five bushel per acre increase due to the phosphorus. Then you take the nitrogen up to where you should be managing it, and you get some more yield increase from the nitrogen, but suddenly that five bushel increase moves to a 17 bushel yield increase from the phosphorus. They complement each other. If you want to raise high yield, there, work it as a package. Um, this is some data there from the DU agronomist there. The locations are in the bottom, North Dakota, South Dakota, five site average in 2010. And again, we're looking at phosphorus. This time we're working with medium and high testing soils and the responses to the phosphorus aren't quite as big there or dramatic, I should say, but this compares them to no fungicide and with fungicide. And again, you see that that increase, even with the phosphorus there, where you're picking up some additional yield from the phosphorus or from the fungicide there, the higher rate of phosphorus will complement it. So just trying to emphasize that package deal there in terms of pulling in the highest profitability you can. 
Um, this is some of the data from eight location average in Northeast North Dakota, 2009 and 2010. There, with its, its nitrogen rates, there from no nitrogen in 30 pound increments up to 150 pounds of nitrogen. The, with that, all of this was put on early spring there with streamer tips and UAN there. And it shows basically what Dave showed for the, for the spring wheats there in terms of the increasing yield curve with increasing increments of nitrogen there on up to 150 and extending on beyond. There, like the spring wheat there, the protein increases are coming in there. What's critical here is we're up to 150 pounds of nitrogen and we're still haven't reached that 12% level of protein where the discounts start there. And the discounts can be quite severe. I think you know that. So I want to talk a little bit about what to do there and Oh, okay, I did make it. Okay, this is the same data chart with a bunch more wording and, and a couple things added to it. The first is these green triangles. Those are a split nitrogen application. There were 30 pounds of nitrogen was applied in early spring and 30 pounds of nitrogen was put on at five leaf stage. There you see in this case, across eight locations, I'm actually picking a little yield bump up over that 60 pound rate and a little bit of protein as well. I don't know if I quite believe that. What you really should expect from in-season applications is equal to if you put it all on. That assumes it got rained in and that you you really needed it and where the advantage is is if you do have that wet spring and you have nitrogen available from either fall applied or early spring applied or high nitrogen test levels from prevented plant there you can get away with delaying a little bit there so springs like last spring you can still get that nitrogen on there you but you've got to have some to start with the other part of this is the red circles and that's the 30 pounds of nitrogen early spring, 30 pounds of nitrogen post flower for a protein application. And like you would expect, there's no difference in yields there, but there is a full percent increase in protein in this case there. And with that, the thing that bothers me is if we take in this 30 pounds put on post, supply, post flower and put it on the spring, we would have got an additional seven bushels and the profitability would have been better. So you need to take a couple of management practices here and you need to transfer them up to the higher spring nitrogen or fall nitrogen rates there to bump that 12% protein level and get everything you can out of the yield. Okay, the other part of that with, with the nitrogen and winter wheat is preventing the end loss. The long-term standard is the application of urea on the surface for winter wheat. And long-term, we know it works great if you get rain right after application. But if you don't get rain right after application, you're gonna take some losses. With that, the end volatilization there, from that, it's really hard to estimate. We know we don't lose it all in any case there, but I think Pretty often we're losing some of it there, and there's no way to estimate an average. It's in, independent there to each situation. One thing to remember is the end loss increase potential increases as your surface residue levels increase. There, with that, it's a urease activity, enzyme activity that volatilizes the nitrogen, more surface con residue contact with the with the urea increases the losses. And what you can do about that is agritain. I don't have time to go into detail on it, but it does work in terms of stopping those losses from urea for 10 to 14 days. 
there. And basically all you're doing is allowing more time for that rainfall event to occur there. The other part of that is there's more and more of the producers are putting on nitrogen, either some there, a few guys are going to all the nitrogen at seeding time and fall application. It too works, but you're at the same or worse scenario for losses there than if you're putting on the fall anhydrous there. Anhydrous or urea, it's going to be nitrate. You've got potential from leaching on sands there, heavy rain spring and fall. And last spring, I think you experienced uh, some serious denitrification when you have the saturated soils when it's wet. So I am out of time, so I'm going to stop there and I'll turn it over to Marcia. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Marsha McMullen from the NDSU Extension Service, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the diseases that are uh, a challenge to winter wheat production. And there are a number listed here, uh, similar to spring wheat as well, but some of the uh, challenges are that winter wheat has less resistance to these diseases. But first of all, I'm going to speak about the viruses, wheat streak mosaic and barley yellowdor. There are a number of rusts that will attack winter wheat. The fungal leaf spot complex includes tan spot and septoria. Uh, Fusarium head blight is also a threat to winter wheat uh, production. And finally, uh, I'll just mention bacterial leaf streak. Joel and Blake already talked about wheat streak mosaic virus, but I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges this year to make sure that we don't have uh, uh, opportunity for this disease to get established in your winter wheat crops. And I think winter wheat streak mosaic is a very devastating disease. This is a picture of volunteers infected with wheat streak mosaic virus, and also a picture of the wheat curl mite. It is only one hundredth of an inch long, so you can't detect it in your volunteers or your crops. And it does not have wings, but it crawls up to uh, plants that are infected or are maturing and positions its body perpendicular. Uh, to the surface so that winds can carry it to adjacent crops. And of course, this year we've had a lot of wind, and so those mites may have moved a little further than their traditional half mile or so. So we need to, as uh, Joel and uh, Blake mentioned, we need to break the green bridge. There are a lot of opportunities for the, the wheat curl mite to survive. Wheat is its favorite host, but it can also survive on corn grassy and certain grassy weeds and a few other small grain crops. And so we are looking at breaking the green bridge this fall, uh, preventing grassy weeds or volunteers in those fields that winter wheat is going to be planted to. And uh, I guess the trick is to not have any dirty fields that you're planting into. And by dirty fields, we don't mean noticeably dirty from the road. We mean walk into those fields and if you see any surviving grassy weeds or volunteers, that probably isn't good enough. And they have to be controlled two weeks prior to planting. And then Joel and Blake also talked about the planting dates. So this is the key this fall to get this disease controlled. There are no rescue treatments. It has to be managed through uh, these strategies. The other uh, yeah, virus disease we've seen quite a bit this year in spring and winter wheat is the uh, late season uh, symptoms you see here on the left of barley yellow dwarf virus. And earlier we saw some uh, pale yellow to golden yellow of the flag leaf before the crop had uh, fully developed. And this is a virus disease transmitted by grain aphids. And this year they came into North Dakota quite early and uh, transmitted the virus, the barley yellow dwarf virus, into the crop. The primary method of management for barley yellow dwarf is aphid control with scouting and determining if there is a risk uh, for this disease. The other, uh, one of the other uh, problems with a lot of uh, winter wheat varieties is that they are, have some susceptibility to the rust, the fungal leaf spots, and also fusarium head blight. And as we get more information and improvement in varieties, we 
hope to manage these diseases with variety resistance. But uh, we also think that at this time, fungicides are very key to managing these diseases. And of course, early season applications of fungicides are used for early tan spot control. And then flowering applications are uh, fungicides are used to manage late season leaf spots and scab. Uh, there is some question about a flag leaf application as well. Last year when we had a lot of stripe rust, I thought this may have been beneficial. But without uh, severe rust pressure, which we are not seeing this year, I, I think the early season and the flowering application are adequate. And some of the data I'm going to show has uh, information about those two treatments. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, we have a lot of susceptibility to some of these diseases in the varieties that are there that you have available. And uh, this was some information from Carrington in 2010 where they evaluated winter wheat varieties for susceptibility to tan spots. And you can see there is a variation in variety response. Decade did not have a lot of tan spot susceptibility, for example. But when we would go to uh, leaf, leaf rust susceptibility, de decade is one of the most susceptible. So there are very few varieties that have good response or good tolerance to all the diseases. And uh, so uh, fungicides are always of a benefit for winter wheat. And of course, we know that Fusarium headlight or scab is also a problem in uh, our winter wheat crops. Uh, currently, we hope that crop rotation will help reduce the risk. And uh, Overland is one of the better winter wheat varieties, and I've also been told Lyman is quite good as well. But I also think that fungicides are um, required for helping reduce the risk of Fusarium headlight. Uh, this is some information provided to me, uh, summarized from Joel Ransom's work in 2007 and 2008, and he was comparing the response to fungicides among 20 spring wheat varieties versus 20 winter wheat varieties. And you can see that in 2007, he had a, a much greater response in the winter wheat than he did in the spring wheat. And in 2008, almost no response am among the spring wheat varieties but oh, approximately 18 bushel response in the winter wheat. So we know that fungicides are very beneficial for winter wheat production. How do I get to the slide? Move the box up. Oh, there. Excuse me, I couldn't see what I needed to do next. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this slide, but I'm going to show a summary of uh, some data from last year provided to me by. Blake Vandervorst, and this is a summary of some Ducks Unlimited locations of winter wheat in North Dakota and South Dakota. And it shows how varieties responded to the use of fungicides. It was an early season application of, of Stratego plus herbicide at um, four to five leaf stage and then Prosaro at early flowering. And you can see all the varieties performed quite well in response to fungicides, a few better than others. And then there was also uh, an economic analysis done with these studies uh, comparing economic return at $6 per bushel wheat versus $9. And all of them were profitable, and certainly some were more profitable than others at both wheat prices. But there was never uh, a non profitable response to fungicides. And finally, I just wanted to mention that there is another disease of. Uh, leaves and heads of wheat called bacterial leaf streak and black chaff. And this year we're seeing quite a bit of this as well because we've had so many rains and uh, winds associated with those rains, creating wounds in the leaf, leaf and head surfaces that allow these bacteria to infect. And uh, we have to remind uh, our growers that fungicides do not work to control the bacterial leaf streak. Uh, but I do think that the the response to fungicides will still be there, even in the presence of bacterial leaf streak. And so our breeders have, our new breeder, winter wheat breeder, has quite a bit of uh, challenges ahead of him with an opportunity to make vast improvements, I think, in disease um, tolerance and resistance. And now I think we have an uh, opportunity for questions. Yeah. We're going to turn on the lecture mode so you don't actually have to type your question. If there's, do we have any questions out there? Lecture mode is now off.
Okay, so Marcia, we have a lot of late seeded corn and spring grain, meaning that we have green host plants well into September. Is there any data indicating weather conditions where mite activity is reduced so producers have a better chance of deciding when to plant to avoid wheat streak mosaic? Seems temperature in the fall are still high, at least in the early part of the planting window. Yes, we're going to have a challenge this year because there's going to be so much more green corn and perhaps some green uh, spring wheat nearby as well. As far as the environmental conditions that uh, might help reduce the risk of mite development and movement into winter wheat, we need cold and dry. Just uh, warm, warm temperatures are not not going to, they would allow mite reproduction and movement uh, more rapidly. At least uh, cooler temperatures would be more beneficial. And that's why we wait until later part of the uh, September to plant, is because the mite, mites are not nearly as active when the temperatures start to drop. We can make a couple of questions. that one more. Oh, no, never mind. I'm sorry. That's the other gray box. I thought it was a question. So far, that's the only question we see on our um, question box. Are there, there certainly must be other questions. If you want to, just press the, if you want to ask a question rather than type it, you got to press the talk button and hold it while you talk. I think if you're on a PC, you can do that with a control or with the mouse. Hit the control key and talk. Okay, we have a question from Chris. Uh, I have a bean and uh, corn rotation, but would like to add winter wheat. I own land and rent to renter. Uh, need help in selling the value of adding winter wheat to rotation for soil health and profitability. I am in South Central South Dakota. You want to take that? Uh, as far as uh, needing help, uh, and selling the benefits. If you're looking from an economic standpoint, I can send you all the data that I've summarized, Chris. Um, just drop me an email. Um, as far as the improvements to soil health and uh, goes, um, I can give you a whole list. I can generate one. Um, but as far as science documenting uh, improvements over uh, optional crop rotations that don't include winter wheat, I'm not aware of of where that data may be, I don't think it exists. Um, but you know, I can make, I can give you a whole list of, of, of benefits that uh, actually we've got the document set up. So Chris or anybody else, if you want to request information in more detail than what was shared, um, you should be able to send any of us uh, uh, an email and uh, make those requests, and we'll respond. And again, all of our contact information with DU is, is found at our website, www.wintercereals.us. And then, of course, the NDSU folks, you know how to find, find them and get a hold of them. But I would, I would suggest, Chris, that you just send me a request, and I'll, I'll flood you with information in detail that, that I can't share right now. See another question there? The one thing I would I would comment on there, Chris, just to follow up to Steve's, would be is that uh, if, if you're in a corn bean rotation, there there should be data uh, available uh, at the universities and possibly through ARS uh, regarding adding wheat to a rotation to that type of rotation, and I think. Uh, we could probably find some things on organic matter, soil carbon, and, and some of those types of things uh, out there in those archives. We might have to do some digging to find that. I know the RS station at Mandan, North Dakota, for example, did a, uh, a rotation that included uh, the wheats and the row crops versus uh, some of the other things. And, and I know they've done a great job of, of pulling together some of that, that soil type data. The other thing I was just going to comment on uh, Roger's uh, comment, and, and Joe and I both hit on this a little bit on the wheat streak uh, issue and, and having the, the neighboring crops 
uh, green crops there, and, and that is an issue, and, and, and we do need to be cognizant of what is around that field you're planning to plant to winter wheat, and uh, maybe another reason for delaying that seeding date uh, further into September. Uh, so, so please keep that in mind. And I think the other thing within that field that you're planning to winter wheat as well, uh, if, if you sprayed the Roundup burn down in late August or early September and you're waiting the two weeks for the volunteers to die, let's say it's, it stays cool and wet like it has the last two Septembers, it takes a long time for those volunteers to die. And, and if you've had a couple more rain showers, you've probably got some more volunteer wheat if you're in a wheat stubble crop, for example, coming up. And you may not have done an adequate job of breaking that green bridge. And so if, if you have not done that, that's a situation where you need to delay that seeding date into the latter part of September and possibly even do a second burn down application, consider a second application. One thing that, that we have done on some of our plots, and we've had, ended up doing seeding late in September each of the last two years because of that issue, uh, we will take that second application because you have small plants and use a gamoxone type product that will uh, take the volunteers out in a two or three day period if you have sunshine. Uh, but the sunshine is a critical part of making your mock zone work. So that would be one option to consider instead of a second application around it. Uh, yes, thanks for that comment, Chris. Uh, Steve and I have talked about this quite a bit. Uh, to our, our tours and our educational opportunities and your comment about adding winter wheat to the rotation gives the, the producer an opportunity to plant a cover crop or a manure crop following the winter wheat. And that's particularly true in, in southern South Dakota, but would, would be more critical even here in North Dakota because our choices are much more limited with our short growing season. Blake, could you oh, touch again on the flax seeding flax rates, if people want to put that in the next, that in week. next week? Okay. Well, I'll have, uh, I'll have Blake follow up, but uh, as I recall, that uh, a typical full seeding rate is 40 pounds. Sound about right? And solid seeding rate. So if you're solid seeding a normal crop, you set at 40 pounds. So if you're going to do strips, you'd want to keep that rate at 40 pounds. That's a full rate. But... You know, as you tape over or whatever you might do to, to shut off the other openers, uh, you're obviously going to put a lot less than that 40 pounds out. And if you are going to solid seed, then I would I would say a half rate, 20 pounds uh, kind of maximum. Uh, oh, sorry, six to eight pounds solid if you're if you're going to do it solid. I was thinking if you skip a couple of rows uh, in that kind of scenario, then you could go with kind of set it down to 20. But if you're doing the strips that we talked about where you're doing a couple of rows and then skipping 10, then I, I think that full rate uh, and then taping over or closing off those others. But maybe you can add anything, Blake, to that. Well, Joel's right. Uh, if, if you're going to do the, the solid seating where you're using all of the openers on the drill, uh, you want to be at that six to eight pound uh, seating rate. If you're uh, doing the strips where you're doing one row or say two rows right together, uh, and then you're leaving a three to five to ten foot gap or, or whatever. I kind of prefer the five foot gap with a single row. Then you should be at that 40 pound rate. And then what you'll need to do is you'll want to try to seed that either this week or the first week of August. Uh, particularly in North Dakota, as you get into South Dakota, you can probably push that into the into the second week of August, particularly in the central and the southern parts of those areas. Um, and then uh, you'll need to be, make a determination call once you get to seeding the winter wheat. Is that flax reach the the early bloom or mid to late bloom stage so that it'll stay erect, have enough lignin in that stem to, to catch some snow? Or if you need to break that green bridge uh, in that flax cover crop, you may need to use something like a shirt to take out the grasses if you want to leave that flax continue to grow after you plant the winter wheat. So there'll be some decisions you'll have to make. Blake, do you expect the flax to use much water? Joel asked the question, do we expect the flax to use much water? And I would say no. What was, what was your feeling, B. Joel? Well, probably not, but is that a bad or a good thing? <laughs> you know, this year, I think we want to use water, but, uh, but uh, you know, in a typical year, maybe we're, we want to conserve it. But, you know, I think, I think we don't, we can't expect it to use a lot of water. Any other questions? <clears throat> 